Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I am Heej, and I am a first year MFA student here at UCSD. And I am excited, excited to introduce our guest lecture artist, Post Com Commodity. Uh, Post Commodity is an interdisciplinary arts collective comprised of Cristobal Martinez and Cade L. Twist. Post Commodities art functions as a shared indigenous lens and voice to engage the assaultive manifestations of the global market and its supporting institutions, public perceptions, beliefs, and individual actions that comprise the ever-expanding multinational, multiracial, and multi-ethnic colonizing force that is defining the 21st century through ever-increasing velocities and complex forms of violence. Recipients of numerous awards, such as from Creative Capital, Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, and the Ford Foundation, Post Commodity exhibit, exhibits nationally and internationally, including the 2017 Whitney Biennial Document of 14 Athens, Greece, and Kassel, Germany, and the 50, 57th Carnegie International in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Please welcome Post Commodity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ish. Um, again, my name is Cristóbal Martínez, and uh, I'm an artist in post-commodity and associate professor and chair of art and te technology at the San Francisco Art Institute. I'm mestizo of Enisaro, Pueblo, Manito, and Chicano heritages in North of Northern New Mexico. And I was raised in El Pueblito de Alcalde, and I'm a descendant from, of families from the Northern New Mexican Pueblos of Abicu, Dixon, Española, Huachupangue, Peñasco, and Velarde. Um, uh, really honored and, and pleased to, to have uh, the opportunity to present with you, uh, present to you with alongside my, my brother, Cade Twist here in Post Commodity. Hi, everyone. I did the classic uh, uh, Zoom foul. I started talking while muted. Um, my name's Cade Twist. It's, it's good to be here with you. Um, I look forward to our talk. Uh, my family, I'm Cherokee. Uh, my family's from Northeast Oklahoma and uh, Locust Grove and Bunch and Greasy. And um, I was raised in Bakersfield, California. And um, I'm one of the members of Post Commodity, uh, one of the, the co-founders, and um, I'm also a um, uh, associate professor uh, in the uh, MFA Fine Arts Department at Otis College of Art and Design and the curricular area head of the Art and Social Practice Emphasis Area. Um, now, um, before we go any further, uh, we wanna take this opportunity to thank um, UCSD for supporting uh, this post-commodity talk. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting us to, to be your guest this afternoon. Uh, we're honored and uh, we will do our best over the, the next hour and a half to serve your communities today in this artist talk. And uh, lastly, we want to acknowledge our academic institutions, Otis College of Art and Design and the San Francisco Art Institute. Thank you, Otis and SFAI for supporting Post Commodity with Academic Homes in California and for supporting our work throughout uh, the Golden State and abroad. So um, I wanna turn it over to you, Kate, if uh, you can share uh, with our uh, audience a little bit about our a statement. Yeah, I wanted, we want to start off, you know, by sharing our intentions as a, as a collective and, you know, why we're doing the work we're doing. Um, you know, our, our practice is, is research driven. And um, for us, it's about meaning making and um, building a place um, and building power around this place for um, indigenous discourse. And um, so we've had this statement um, 
for quite some time. There are two really long run-on sentences, um, but I think it's still very accurate and very relevant. And, um, but I wanna share it with you so that you know what we're getting at in our work. Uh, Post Commodity is an interdisciplinary arts collective comprised of Cristobal Martinez and Kate Twists, our art functions as a shared indigenous lens and voice to engage the assaultive manifestations of the global market and its supporting institutions, public perceptions, beliefs, um, and individual actions that comprise the ever-expanding multinational, multiracial, and multi-ethnic colonizing force that is defining the 21st century in ever-increasing forms of violence and uh, post-commodity works to, um, to forge new metaphors uh, capable of rationalizing our shared experiences you know, within, the, within this increasingly challenging contemporary environment. And seek to promote a constructive discourse that challenges the social political and economic processes that are destabilizing communities and geographies and to connect indigenous narratives of cultural self-determination with the broader public sphere. If, if there's one thing about our work that you'll notice, um, we, it takes many forms, but the voice um, is legible in all of our work. Um, because it's coming from this place, all of it, all the work we produce is coming from this place. Now, uh, Cristobal uh, is going to share with us um, uh, more information about why, why we're here, why we exist, and, and um, what it means to be working collectively. Thank you, Kate. And, and I'm sorry I made a distracted you a little bit. I went to shut my phone off and I accidentally called you. I'm so sorry, man. Um, yeah, I thought so, I was muted again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we get this question a lot. So we just, you know, in Q and A's, this is almost a question that always shows up. And so we just, we just wanna, um, we just wanna address it right away. A question we often get is, um, someone will inevitably raise their hand and ask us why an art collective? Why, why you know, what, what is it about a collaboration um, that, you know, is a reason for uh, having a, an entity uh, called post-commodity? And so uh, there's a few reasons for that. Uh, one is um, we, We've all uh, shared a, a common interest in making large scale immersive work. And um, so uh, part of it is being able to create um, the interdis an interdisciplinary uh, collective or environment where a group would have um, uh, a broad range of, of knowledge and capacity so that a lot of the, the work, the, both the administration of work and the, the conceptualization and creation of work could be uh, done uh, in-house within the collective. Being able to operate that way as a collective uh, ha has made it possible for post-commodity to really stretch their budgets and uh, has allowed us to achieve um, uh, the, a lot of these large scale pieces um, uh, with, in a very uh, cost uh, efficient manner. And then also in a manner that is um, that is also uh, uh, consistent with uh, what we can do as as a group uh, in terms of um, in terms of uh, the sweat equity that we bring to the table. So we often say that you know a, a collective is is much greater than the than its individual parts. That the, the sum of it, the collective, is 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 really valuable. Um, another, so, you know, that's, that's a kind of, you know, capitalist explanation for, uh, for, a, for a, a collective called post-commodity, uh, acknowledging that we are suspended um, by capitalism and, and, you know, both um, 
uh, using it and resisting it and everything in between. Um, well, at the same time, uh, we also work in the collective because it's a, it has a lot to do with how we were raised as indigenous people. And um, so there, uh, a, a thing that, one of the things that's really important about uh, po post-commodity is that it's a place where, um, where uh, Western knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems are syncretized, where we bring these ways of knowing uh, into close proximity and interaction with one another in order to create uh, 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 works of art. But because there is indigenous knowledge systems circulating within our practice uh, in order to be able to create an environment so that uh, indigenous knowledge can circulate, uh, it really requires uh, thinking as a group and thinking as a learning community. So we use our uh, you, we use the collective as a way to to move from interdisciplinarity to transdisciplinary transdisciplinarity where uh, we teach each other we teach one another skill sets that we acquire along the way. So each work of art is a pedagogical opportunity that we use to educate each other, and we also use uh, works of art as opportunities to strengthen our relationships with one another. And that's a, a way that we uh, honor our ancestors and we honor our families and we uh, bring how we were raised uh, into the, uh, as a sort of framework for how we create contemporary art. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move us along and, and we're gonna look at the, the first uh, piece. Um, what we want to do is, um, we want to uh, present to you a, uh, a, a work. Um, we're gonna present to you two projects that, that we've recently uh, completed in California. We're gonna bookend it. So one project at the beginning of the talk and one project at the end. This one here um, uh, is uh, potentially uh, a long duration sound art work located in San Francisco titled the point of final collapse. And I want to start out by identifying for you uh, the building illustrated in the current slide. And this building is a residential high rise uh, located in downtown San Francisco and it's named Millennium Tower. Uh, there are three things that make this building uh, significant, uh, not only in San Francisco, but throughout the world. And so the first point of significance is that the condominium units uh, within the tower are some of the most expensive real estate in the world. The second point is that since the building was brought to structural completion in 2008, uh, the building has sunk uh, probably now over 18 inches and leaning over 14 inches to the west since last reported in uh, 2019. And the third and final point is that the building was engineered as a heavy concrete building uh, that was not anchored into bedrock. And so it sits on top of the peninsula that is referred to as infill or land that was added on through human intervention. So uh, what this causes uh, is, a, is a, a certain problem with this particular region uh, that is known as liquefaction. And the liquefaction in this area has been known since the 1906 San Francisco earthquake where the infill itself is susceptible to behaving like liquid during a substantial earthquake. And so um, the point of final collapse is a sound installation and broadly conceptual work that focuses on the sinking Millennium Tower and responding to a scenario of capitalism contributing to the development of new conceptual frameworks of risk and accountability. So as the building falls, its value rises. Uh, in this work, post commodity engages the perspectives of broad of a broad public by uh, providing a call to prayer, and we and we use uh, long range acoustic devices or LRADs to do this. And uh, through these, uh, uh, we're often used as sonic weapons, military weapons. Uh, we provide this call to prayer for relief from the economic stresses and dangers 
of a city in the throes of radical social, cultural, architectural, and economic transformation. And this is pre-COVID. But now with COVID, we're seeing this, these issues amplified even further. Uh, our installation uh, uses computational algorithms that parse data representing the movement of the tower. And so this movement data is then mapped to healing ASMR audio and soothing binaural beats, uh, transforming the sonification of the sinking and tilting of the Millennium Tower into therapeutic sounds that are designed to encourage relaxation by extending the power of the city's scenic beauty. And so uh, long range acoustic devices are, are installed, the, the ones that we use are installed at the tower at uh, the San Francisco Art Institute's historic Chestnut Street campus and subtly broadcast this indeterminate and generative multi-channel sound composition to North Beach and uh, for a four minute duration each day at 5.01 PM. And the point of final collapse renders legible is the logics of capitalism that encode fear, desire, and um, really speak to the inability for the greater public to both rationalize and control systems of, of power. And so there's just a couple of small little sort of bullet points that I wanna share with you so that you can think about when you're, when you're contemplating or reflecting on this piece. Um, one is that uh, the reason, one of the reasons why the, the Millennium Tower is of such great interest to us, besides the fact that it's sinking and tilting, is that uh, it represents metaphorically to us a monument to anxiety. And this is a monument to anxiety that is, um, that, um, is um, um, th this monument to anxiety is a representative of um, uh, this sort of economic hubris or exuberance. So this building was completed, for example, during the time of the 2008 uh, housing market crash. So um, we're, oh my goodness, there's a lot of noise happening outside. Just give me one moment, please. Um, so um, we, we see this like as a, um, a way for um, us to think about a neoliberal feedback loop where on the one hand, you have a, a structure in the city that's creating anxiety, and you know, and that's that's a you know, hundreds of millions of dollars um, uh, enterprise, and then in response you have a, a system of medicine, a system of a, a holistic medicine um, uh, that is now that has now emerged in order to uh, as a cell for the anxiety. So we see this kind of. Uh, very simplified feedback loop taking place, which is sort of the center of our critique here. And so um, at the, the last point that I'll make is that uh, what, 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 we're, what this piece is really uh, um, centering on is the, the idea that um, uh, when, when you have government corruption and greed and, and economic hubris present, um, it, it creates an environment where um, uh, it becomes very um, difficult to, um, uh, to, to, to have to exist in. And so um, with that said, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Kate. And I got a little distracted with the dump truck outside. So maybe you can like clean up a little bit of the last part of that for me, if, if you have some some more things to say. Well, you know, I, I think you covered this work really, really well. You know, one of the things that I would add uh, to this is these are life and death serious issues that are unfolding in um, San Francisco. Uh, it, it's nothing to, you know, to take lightly However, and or however, um, still it's important to 
be human and to humanize the shared experience that we have in these really intensely contested spaces, um, whether they're political or social or economic or psychological or all of the above at once. Um, so injecting humor into this with humanity is also a part of this. And this isn't like a one-off, you know, prank or humorous trope. It's a meditation on the hubris of this feedback loop. And it is a way of interrupting it with humanity and humor because the soundtrack, you know, using, you know, ASMR can come across as humorous and the context can be, you know, perceived and is legible as a humorous response. Um, Sometimes when you're at the end of the world or, you, you know, you're in a point of crisis, you know, you, you think about humor or you laugh um, or you, you, you have a, a moment of release. And our hope is to be respectful in this way, but to help facilitate that moment of release. Um, and 501 is that moment of release. It's the first hour traditionally of the workday when hap it's the first minute of happy hour, you might say, is when this launches off. It's the first minute for those of us who work and can leave our desks at five. Um, it's a way of reclaiming your identity and yourself and your relationship with this land. Um, so uh, I just wanted to add that type of, of thing to the conversation. And then we've got a sample of, of what it sounds like. Yeah, thank you, Kate. And you know, now that the garbage truck outside my house is gone and I got a little more clarity, one thing that is really important about that humor that Kate is talking about is you have a, an LRAD, which is used by uh, the military. It's like a sonic ray gun and it's been used to to silence public demonstrations and it's been used for a lot of uh, highly questionable things, highly questionable interventions throughout the world. And so um, there's something about, there's something semiotically unstable or destabilizing about uh, some, uh, hu uh, something that's medicine or something that's meant to heal projected from uh, an instrument of war. And that instability, that, so, that semiotic instability, you might think of it as a metaphor for the situation in uh, San Francisco. Like how much more pre economic pressure can a city withstand? And it's also um, tying to the, the seismic activity of the city as well. So this idea there's instability all the way around and uh, really sort of highlighting that in this work. Um, thanks, Kate. Okay, yeah. um, let's go play that little sample. Yeah, that'd be great.
Uh, uh, let's go ahead and uh, move on. Uh, I don't know if that heals me or makes me feel like um, I don't want to do anything. Makes me feel apathetic. But I, I think a lot of times this part of this critique is that ASMR is like anesthetizing us. It's putting us to sleep. Meanwhile, there's all this uh, crazy stuff happening, you know, behind the curtain. And uh, anyway, um, shifting over to uh, another work. Um, this work, uh, let us pray for the water between us. Um, was staged at uh, the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And um, we were working in this space, you know, this venerated space, which traditionally houses authentic Greek sculpture. Do you know, want... Greek, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I just want to say, uh, just in case, um... The, the statue of Doriferous, this Greek statue of Doriferous. Sorry to interrupt. And, and I, I didn't mean to downplay the significance of this uh, sculpture by saying authentic Greek sculpture, but I think of it as that. And, um, you know, there's a challenge where we're in the 21st century. This is, this museum is, is built like in one of the, on top of one of the sacred sites of of Lakota people, Minneapolis actually is as well, uh, the entire city. Um, but this specific location really speaks to that. And in the 21st century, we're still reflecting on a very Western ideal, um, and it's venerated in it dominates the climate. Um, it imbues a spirit into this space that um, uh, has proven to be tremendously violent uh, to indigenous people in the Western hemisphere. So um, we negotiated to show the piece in this space because it would result in a process of replacing the, the Greek artifacts um, with contemporary work and contemporary indigenous discourse and contemporary art making strategies. Um, with this piece, um, we, were, we struck all of the Greek statues in the space. We kept the art, the, um, the infrastructure that exhibits uh, the work, um, we, we left it so that the emptiness or the, the absence of what occupied the space prior to us uh, showing here um, so that that could be part of the work, part of the institutional critique, but also a part of focusing the intention uh, and the attention and intention of the space towards a shared experience. And this, what you're looking at is a 2200 gallon uh, chemical storage tank that we dyed black. Um, uh, and uh, this uh, is used as part of a, um, uh, an agriculture chemical infrastructure, you know, for mixing, um, um, pharmaceutical uh, for for mixing pesticides uh, and for also uh, mixing um, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm blanking I'm sorry I'm having a zoom moment but uh, fertilizers and pesticides uh, and the interesting thing is in a place like Minneapolis which is one of the largest storehouses of water in North America and uh, definitely in the US. And um, it's the headwaters of the Mississippi River, which has played a significant role in defining our hemisphere uh, long before the United States existed. Um, you know, to be in this place of this water and, and to know that 
there are agricultural practices in terms of policy to where you can have uh, as you know a number of these uh, filled up on your land and not be subject to any regulation or oversight. And so that any spill or mitigation of toxic chemicals um, will not be reported, will, will not be um, mitigated in, in a way that's uh, accountable to the public. Um, and in a place like Minneapolis, which has an incredibly shallow water table I mean, you could dig a, a hole knee deep and water will start, you'll, you'll strike water. Um, the, the, the combination of policy and environment create a very difficult um, and potentially challenging future uh, for all people who depend on potable water, which is, you know, all living, you know, humans, all living things. So um, we wanted to, to create this piece um, to get at those issues, to um, begin a, a dialogue um, in the space that are to bring a dialogue that exists, you know, in, in the ecological movements of the area, um, to bring that into, into the gallery space. But, you know, let us so that's some of the ideas, you know, behind the work, but, you know, let us pray for the water between us is, you know, it's, it's really about the complexity of human relationships more than it's about a container that's holding poison, you know, because we are bound as people by these shared resources and it's becoming increasingly difficult to protect and preserve, um, our clean water from waste and contamination. It, it's becoming di more difficult, in other words, to protect and preserve ourselves from each other, um, you know, to ensure our future, uh, a, a, a livable future. Um, so this work, um, we modified the tank. Um, we placed uh, a brushless, motor that is programmable uh, inside the tank um, and programmed it to beat out a composition. And the composition is something that um, is, is, is really qu quite special because it, it decenters time and the perception of time. Um, it starts every with you know a beat on the four second because it's a four second decay in this space from the striking of the of this drum so we started the composition at a four second interval and the composition grows to an eight second interval um 10 milliseconds uh per beat Till it reaches eight seconds and then it shrinks back to four seconds by the same till 10 milliseconds a beat. So what you have is a continuous beat that is constantly expanding and retracting in duration. And in a sense, it in a space like this, it's so reverberant and so attuned to percussive sounds that you have this sense of, you know, what time is it? How, you know, this always shifting time signature, um, always shifting context, always shifting presence. And um, of course the sound has this really tremendous uh, low end, you know, sub bass. And it not only filled this rotunda, um, but also filled the, the entire wing of the museum with this very calming, you know, resonating somber drumbeat. And what we found is that people would come from, you know, during the opening, people came from all corners of the opening just to stand there and be quiet with it, you know? And this was in one of the reception areas of the opening and it was still that way. 
you know, it, it brought people to it and it facilitated a deep listening, a deep present listening, almost something that harkens to like Pauline Oliveros uh, or something to that. And um, all I can say is a super heavy experience and a, a joy to put a piece like this together. But it's something that, you know, wouldn't have happened without the curator we were working with, Gabe uh, Richter, um, and also the, the team at MIA. Um, this, to, to achieve this piece, we had to get the permission of the board, um, you know, to remove the sculptures. This was a collaborative process. This was a process of intersubjective negotiation of meaning, of place and time, of intent, of action. And it transformed from an individual act to an institutional act um, and an institutional stewardship over the course of due to COVID about eight months. So um, it was a very beautiful expression um, uh, on behalf of, I, I'd like to say us, the artists and, but also, and you know, very importantly, so um, the institution, the board and, and our curator who went along with us for this two year journey um, to bring this piece to life. And I, I'd like to thank you so much, Kate. Uh, really, really beautiful um, articulation of this work. And um, I just want to also uh, uh, share out that this uh, rotunda uh, is is uh, customarily the primary entrance to the um, Minneapolis Institute of Art, and so it it sort of um, is designed to uh, showcase or sort of landmark or hallmark this um, uh, ideology of um, Western civilization and Jeffersonian uh, philosophies of neo-enlightenment and how they connect with um, uh, democracy and, and, uh, and a history of Greece being the, the cradle of democracy. And so, um, uh, you can think about this as the kind of heart, the, the sort of heart chamber of the building. And so you have this beating heart there now. And, and where we're thinking about life, we're thinking about being alive and reflecting on being alive and, 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 and thinking about how, you know, for us as humans, the you know fundamental elements of, of of living and life for us is our blood, and our blood being in the water, and 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 needing that clean water to survive. So you have you have both a heart that's beating in the space, and you also have lungs in the space. You also have breathing that's happening because. The, as Kate was saying, the beat is like expanding slowly from four second intervals to eight second intervals and then it's compressing. So it's like a heart and it's also like a lung. So um, I wanna share with you another work. We both wanna share with you another work that is also about collaborating with an institution. Oh, I'm sorry, let's listen to the drum. For those of you out there, if you had have headphones, please put them on. You'll have an entirely different sonic experience because it is sub bass and your um, laptop uh, speakers will not really pick it up.
Okay, so we're going to move on to, uh, we're going to show you two more pieces. And um, as Kate was mentioning earlier, there's, you know, strongly collaborative nature, oftentimes between post commodity and commissioning institutions. And he uh, talked a lot of, uh, or a little bit about how um, uh, part of the process is is a, is a co-determined process or an intersubjective negotiation as Kate referred to it, where uh, we have to come into dialogue with an institution. And a lot of this is really kind of turning social practice against the institution itself. The institution has rhetoric like deploy, deploy social practice. It's almost like war rhetoric. It's very colonial institutions trying to remake neighborhoods in the image of themselves, according to their own values and, and, and belief structures. And so, you know, for us responding to that as a collective, we started to turn it back in on the institution because we realized that for us, um, whenever we make a work of art or position a work of art within, the, um, within an institution, it almost always inevitably requires some kind of diversity training. Because, you know, there is the presence and circulation of indigenous knowledge in our work. And so now institutions become the steward of indigenous knowledge. And so in order for the institutions to steward our, our work and steward indigenous knowledge, we have to make sure that an institution is prepared for that. That an institution has the required education and it's messy business. It doesn't always work out. You know, there's a, we make mistakes along the way. The, the institution makes mistakes along the way. But ultimately, a lot of our strategy is trying to ensure that the institution has skin in the game. And what I mean by that is that if the institution has skin in the game, it's going to be a lot more than lip service. And it can actually affect institutional policy. So the first example, the drum, well, what is skin in the game? Let's take let's take the venerated artifacts of the institution. Let's remove them and let's put in its place an ascension of, ha of a hazmat chemical storage tank. And let's have that conversation. That's a, uh, uh, that, that's a politically uh, very sensitive and compromising position for an institution to be in, 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 in engaging in a relationship with uh, a, a Native American collective, an indigenous collective. And then let's look at this piece here. This piece, what is significant and where the institution has skin in the game is that these uh, concrete co columns, they're actually measured pound for pound to the very limit of what the roof can support. Any more weight to this roof and it could potentially collapse. So there's another situation where the institution has skin in the game. This, this piece here is called with each incentive. And Kate, did you wanna say something? Oh, I was just gonna say uh, something about uh, the removal of the statues, but um, uh, just to, I didn't mean to be interruptive. Or no, no, no worries. No. But it's just one important note is, it, those were not canceled or removed permanently. Yes. It was just yes. part of an exhibit. Our work was allowed to be positioned there. There's only two exhibitions prior to ours that have displaced the Greek statues. And they were also historic in nature of a similar era. Um, the most recent being um, the, the, the a, a bunch of artifacts from you know, Egypt, the King Tut exhibition that was going around. Um, I, I just wanted to bring that up that, yeah, because removing something can equate to cancel culture and all of these types of things. And uh, I don't think that um, this is a part of that. And sorry. Uh, yes, no, that's a really important uh, point to make. And I'm really glad that you made it. Because that's what it means to, to enter into collaboration. That's what it means to enter into a consent, consensual meaning making and political negotiation, uh, which is something that we see a, a lot of society struggling with at large right now. Um, we, we are interested in dialogues and dialogues that have a lot of give and take. There's a lot of reciprocity you know, associated with the dialogue 
And, um, you know, it would also be um, pretty uh, disingenuous, really, for us to, to just um, uh, uh, permanently remove a, a, a cultural idea. We, you know, we want to be in dialogue with cultural ideas. We don't necessarily uh, want to, to we're, there's a diplomatic stance a rival hypothesis stance as opposed to a warfare stance. Um, so um, uh, like I said, this is a collective where we syncretize knowledge as opposed to create us versus them narratives. Uh, we all have to live together. We, we have to learn to live together. And that's really what this piece is about. Um, this piece is titled with each incentive and it was installed in uh, 2019 on what's called the Blum Family Terrace at the Art Institute of Chicago. This is a free public space. You know, anyone could access this sculpture. And uh, it's comprised of cinder block and concrete and steel rebar. And um, what this is, is it's a sculptural installation. Or it's, it's like a ceremonial complex of columns constructed of cinder, cinder block and steel rebar. And they're all at various stages of completion. Uh, it highlights, uh, what this work does is it highlights a generative aspect of architecture. And you see this kind of architecture really all over the world, but our, our principal focus here is in Latin America. And uh, here in Latin America, um, this, these uh, structures signify uh, a building that is con constantly uh, expanding. Uh, to meet the challenging needs of growing families and communities. And so a lot of times uh, you find this even where I'm from in New Mexico, like if, if you build a house, you start out small and as, and as uh, new members of the family are born into the world, you start adding onto the house. So the house grows with the family. And so you'll find this you know, like in places in Mexico and you know, Peru, you know, all over Latin America where, uh, people will build their house, but they'll have these columns in place on the second story, just sort of ready to go in case, you know, there's a need to add an extra, an extra room, extra story. Now, this uh, pragmatic approach to construction of being prepared to add on uh, presents a new framing of the historic, uh, the city's historic skyline, uh, challenging viewers to imagine an indigenous future for Chicago. And the work reimagines the Blum Family Terrace as a stage for Chicago's architectural future and contemplates how the city might be transformed by the current wave of indigenous American refugees from Mexico and Central and South America. And the project is a symbolic gesture uh, toward a desirable future that considers culturally defined kinship centric architecture and the reason why this is so important in Chicago is because Chicago has a huge Latin American population and a huge population of um, um, Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants who inhabit the city. And, and we find it both funny and ironic that, it, that this has happened in Chicago because uh, Chicago, at the University of Chicago, there was a, um, there was a school called the, uh, uh, there was a school of economics that um, where um, scholars uh, like Milton Friedman uh, began to theorize uh, or to begin to develop neoliberal theories of, um, of, the, of the economy, of, of an economy or market systems and uh, actually worked with the CIA to recruit students from uh, Chile uh, to come to Chicago to study these theories. And what they did was they, they essentially banked ideologies of neoliberalism into the students and used the students as a kind of deployment mechanism for infecting the country of Chile with an economic ideology that eventually led to one of the most brutal dictatorships the Americas have ever known. And these, the, the, this, these folks who were there supposed to liberate Chile actually became some of the uh, biggest subjugators of, uh, of indigenous people in Chile, known as the Chicago Boys. 
And that's created so much destabilization. This sort of neoliberal economic theory has created so much destabilization throughout Latin America. It's forced a lot of the migration we're seeing today. So we, you know, we found it kind of interesting, well, very interesting and, and kind of funny too. So uh, there's a real uh, a special site specificity to this work. And then the other thing that we do is we take the architecture, which is the, which is the contemporary wing of uh, the Museum of the Art Institute of Chicago, which, which was designed by a, a very uh, famous uh, architect who does art museums, Re Renzo Piano. And this is very prestigious contemporary architecture. And we sort of like, like it, uh, it, it, in a way, indigenize it and, uh, and, and sort of uh, play with the sort of highbrow, you know, high art, high architecture discourse in a way that um, uh, complicates the intentionality and the public facing. Uh, uh, intentionality of, of the um, Museum of the Art Institute of Chicago itself. The last thing I will say is that this piece references an indigenous American worldview of continual emerging, always becoming, always manifesting. And it's about making space socially, culturally, and aesthetically for refugees and for the intergenerational stewardship of family culture and community. Kate, I'll turn it over to you. If you've got anything additional you'd like to say about this? Yeah, I think you did a great job uh, and took, took a good uh, walk through the piece, I thought. Um, you know, the thing that I think about when I think about this piece, in addition to what's been covered, is it makes me ask the question, uh, especially in the context of the art world and an organization called Art Place America, you know, like what, what is placemaking? What is creative placemaking? And what does it entail? And at what point can it look like this? At what point can a, a museum invest in infrastructure for a new population? that is emerging, that is not Anglo, that is not Eurocentric in its values and aspirations um, and its disciplining. You know, um, there's a beautiful poeticism to the concept of placemaking as it's been defined by like Art Place America and, and uh, other uh, cities and states and, and, you know, um, but it, it's just rarely, rarely delivered. And for us, it, it, this is a way to position a metaphor um, that not only addresses these um, very important issues of um, migration and- This is a reminder. Sorry. Five days from now. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Alexa, off. <laughs> I'm staying in this place. It's all wired right now uh, with Alexa stuff. It's, it's crazy. But um, that idea of placemaking is, is sacred and beautiful and poetic. And we just wanted to position a metaphor that could register with the human rights crisis of our, of our hemisphere, of our time, and this huge migration of people um, that is very similar to some of the great migrations from the South to the North in the past. Do we have the capacity of, uh, as, a, as, as, as you know, human beings, as a society, to actually make room for people in ways that overcome the violence of the past? That Chicago didn't do a very good job of making place for Black people during the Great Migration. Uh, quite the opposite. Are we going to see, you know, the 990,000 um, Mexican American and, and, and Mexican uh, immigrant um, peoples who now live in Chicago, are we going to see them just 
destroyed um, psychologically, socially, economically through subjugation? Are we going to lose our indigenous um, epistemologies and, and uh, uh, ways of knowing and being and the process? You know, there's so much at stake and we have so much, uh, so many resources at our disposal. Um, uh, so hopefully um, uh, all we can bring to life is a metaphor and, and hope that we can add value to an existing conversation and build on the sweat of millions of people who have come before us. Um, but this as a metaphor, just it really sitting with it, standing with it, being there in the city, um, I've, I don't cry a lot. I, I cried. And not only did I cry, the entire construction crew um, <laughs> that was building it cried. And the <laughs> vice president of this multinational construction company that did this thing was there personally because it was his pet project because he felt like he was building a, this for his workers. He took this pro bono to send a message to his workers that, yeah, we can contribute to building a future for all of us here. Um, and this future includes you in a way that is powerful and venerated, just like it includes me, you know? So that, that was something that was really beautiful to the, to the piece. And I did cry. And I saw Cristobal cry too. I mean, <laughs> it was yeah, like we, me we, listening to the Smiths and getting ready for karaoke, but it was <laughs> way more serious. You know, it, you know, a part, part of the reason why we cry is because uh, we're both sons of tradesmen. And there we were with this construction crew and this diverse construction crew. You know, you had you had people from all over the hemisphere there, uh, uh, people of color and and white people, just everybody, really just kicking ass together, being together, building together, and working so beautifully together, and really enjoying their work, and it just you know it's beautiful, just the whole experience so beautiful, and. Um, Here's another what um, another uh, an idea that in many ways relates uh, moving forward. Katie, hey, you wanna you wanna get us up and running with this one? Yeah, I, I I've got a barking dog, so hopefully it doesn't like irritate everybody. Um, you know, but okay. So this is an interesting piece. Um, it's very, we're showing it to demonstrate a few things. One of them is just to demonstrate some of the, the pragmatism we exercise as a collective and uh, the different forms uh, and, you know, our, our work can take shape. Um, this is called Some Reach While Others Clap. It was um, produced in 2020. And what you're looking at are the steel I-beam supports uh, that are inside LAX art. Um, they remodeled their current space, which is a former recording studio and a former sound stage um, uh, for the film industry. But uh, a lot of great recordings by, you know, like Beach Boys and, and um, uh uh, Elvis and um, James Brown and you know it, it's just there are literally you know hundreds of hits that were recorded in this space um, but uh, you know uh, when they remodeled the space they revealed these beams these I beams and um, when we looked at the space um, we knew exactly what to do. Um, we, we knew those beams called out to us. And, um, and then we started a dialogue with uh, uh, the, the curator, um, Hamza Walker. And this dialogue um, 
led to an outcome, right? But, uh, you know, and, and you're looking at it, but the dialogue itself, imagine this, that you're wanting to look at these beams and you're looking at the infrastructure of an art institution that's laid bare and it's just calling for, you know, a, a form of institutional critique. And, um, and that's what we wanted to do. But how often do you get to collaborate with a curator of Hamza Walker's stature to do a deep meditation on institutional critique from the outside and inside? And then how do you extend the spirit and energy and the intentions of that critical gesture, you know, beyond the exhibition rotation cycle that defines how we traditionally experience art in person? You know, further, how do we engage in critique in a way that is generous, in a way that's respectful to the institution, in a way that is indigenous that we can stand behind. And we've shown you some examples, and this is another example to where um, we've learned through institutional critique that the challenge is extending the gesture. It's because when the gesture is developed, there are resources at the table, there are ideas, there are hearts and minds, there are board members, um, there are members of the press, there are things that are just assembled for discussion that, that rarely get assembled. And the question we had was, well, let's extend this. And so what we wanted to do to extend this was to think about medicine, right? And, you know, so think about medicine for a while and let's think about low riders. And we don't think about lowriders and medicine and or lowriders as spiritual mediators, but let's think about for just a second, because lowriders have been indigenous American mobile sovereign spaces, you know, since their inception. They they broadcast visual and sonic knowledge, I mean, without a doubt. And we called upon this history because you know, you think about what's happening with lowrider builders is they're hacking an infrastructure. They're hacking a transportation infrastructure um, on every street they exist. Streets are built for speed. They're built to transport things efficiently, quickly from point A to point B, whereas the low rider was built to slow down velocity. Just the opposite, not how fast we could go, it's how slow you can go. And how can we hack the violence of velocity? We can hack it by going 55 miles an hour on a freeway where everybody's trying to drive 85. Or we could hack it by driving 15 miles an hour, you know, jacked up three feet above the floor, bouncing crazy out of control. You know, that's how we can we can hack time and, and, and this exchange of velocity um, that all of our tax paying money supports and invests in. Um, so to us, these, hack, these hackers, these lowrider builders, they're medicine people. They're visionaries. Yeah. yeah. They're representing a tradition that is very familiar to where... Cristobal and I come from, and um, their medicine, among many other things, is the paint they use, the pinstripes, the layers of candy they put in, the metal flake, all of that is the medicine. And we wanted to bring the medicine of indigenous self-determination as it existed in LA County, as it existed in the homeland of LAX art, which is on the homeland of Chicano people, which is on the homeland of Tongva people, you know, um, which is on the homeland of a spirit which overcame desecration, 
which overcame genocide and the mobilization of the Spanish missionary system. You know, all of this is here. The roads that Chicano people cruise down every day are the same roads that were used to march Tongva slaves into their captivity, into their future of subjugation. So let's pause for a moment, think about how to take this and bring it into the space and how to extend the intervention beyond um, what was intended with the original invitation to show work. So this was very simple. Let's paint these beams. Once you paint those beams, they're not gonna want to remove the paint. They're not gonna wanna desecrate that because they'll have to do a physical act and invest in labor and money to the tune of over a thousand dollars to sand that off and to remove it. So we had a feeling if we did that, it would lead to an inevitable. But the thing is, so did um, Hamza. In fact, Hamza had more, he was already thinking ahead of us in some ways. He's like, you know what y'all need to do is make some covers for those beams now that you're gonna be painting those beams. And then those covers can protect those beams, keep them here so that when we are able to reopen after COVID, cause this was the last show before COVID, you know, um, uh, at LAX. And uh, so he, he was saying that you know, we could create beams that they would support the funding for it um, so that we can cover them up so they'll be there. And then if you want at a later time, maybe there's a way that we can remove them and remember them. And then right there, that's all it took. That was the conversation that led to this piece um, transferring from some reach while others clap to a social practice piece of long duration um, called in relation. And in relation is the idea of stewardship that Cristobal has been talking about. And it's the idea of an institution taking the responsibility and accountability of stewardship very, very seriously. So um, the institution LAX Art went on a fundraising campaign and raised money to protect this and to pay for programming uh, to help us develop um, a collaborative process or an algorithm for this work to extend beyond our lifetimes and, um, and be beyond the, the lifetime of, the, of uh, what we ever thought was the original intention of the project. And so now what we're doing with this, every winter solstice, we're taking these covers off and then we're, we're opening up the beams to the public and having a listening session and a community reflection on the year, what we went through, what we experienced and what we look forward to building together uh, throughout the coming year. So a way of marking time and preparing communities for the coming year. So we transformed a space collectively, um, collaboratively with the board, with the curator, and with us um, from an individual artwork into a ceremonial space that extends beyond the exhibition time into the futures of our shared history. Uh, thank you. That was awesome, man. And we, we're like spectacularly uh, over time. So um, we're just gonna stop. We're just gonna do a hard stop because questions and inter in public interaction and conversation is so important to us. So. I'm just going to go ahead and pull out of the pull out of the PowerPoint here, and uh, we can go into uh, we can go, turn it over to Bailey and Bailey, if you could lead us, and uh, we're really looking forward to taking questions. Uh, thank you so much, Cristobal and Kate, for that amazing lecture. That was really inspiring. Uh, thanks so much. We do have a few questions from the audience. Right on. Okay. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Let's see. You mentioned humor has an ability to create a release of stress and anxiety. Can you speak more about the ways that humor functions throughout your practice? Sure. I... Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think humor has been a very important tool as a counterpoint 
to violence um, and as a way to create a misdirection um, to what's expected in, in a work or in a discourse and um, you know, to serve as a counterpoint um, as, as, so I, I think it, it exists in every work that we've done. It's in the DNA and, and in the design of our work. Um, going back to the first work we ever thought of, which was Repellent Fence. Took us eight years to do, but it was the first work we thought about. That itself, I mean, was, it's a ridiculous gesture to, to think about a, an artwork that would be so ceremonious that is the result of a bird repellent product, right? So there are things that we just really structure and debate and think about to maintain the humorous action without it existing as a trope or a one-off or insincere. We also too, like we, we grew up in families where like uh, and cultures where humor is just a, that's a part of daily life. And you're always joking, you're always laughing and are, you're always teasing each other too. And, and, and um, teasing one another is the, one of the greatest expressions of, of love where, where, where I grew up. Like if you're getting teased and you're just getting drilled that uh, it, it's hard to deal with it sometimes, but but then you realize they, my 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 uncles, for example, they're doing that to me, because they're it's their way of saying I love you, and um, so it's an expression of love. Sometimes the love is brutal. Sometimes it's a brutal love, but um, the thing about humor is that it is also a medicine. It creates a psycho a psycho spiritual environment by which we might be able to see something differently than yes. we would otherwise be able to see. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Right on. Thank you so much for that. That Yeah, that's really inspiring to think about humor as a counterpoint to violence for sure. Uh, let's see. A little bit more of a specific question. Um, Container Terminal asks, in regards to the Millennium Tower piece, how did you get the sound of sinking? Was there a sensor installed in the tower? Okay, really, really good question. Um, we, we explored a variety of possibilities with this and installing sensors in the tower was, um, was actually one of the, um, one of the mechanisms uh, uh, that we considered along the way. But what we learned was that there's so much litigation associated with the tower right now. There's a matrix of accountability. It's a really kind of optimistic way of looking at blame. And so you, you, there, you know, there's like, there's like a, over a dozen um, uh, stakeholders that are all sort of pointing the finger at each other, investors that are pointing the finger at each other. There's a lot of pending lawsuits and it's a very complex and litigious situation. It's the reason why the building it just continues to sink because the, the legal situation is so complex that it cannot be so easily and timely resolved. Um, as a result of that, um, we, we learned that there, the data, um, engineering data is, is published through the court documents. And so uh, we, we didn't have to actually install sensors onto the building itself because uh, uh, the, the data was made uh, available through the court proceedings. So we've just been querying data um, uh, from, um, from all of these court proceedings. And what we're currently sonifying is we're sonifying uh, from uh, structural completion in uh, 2016 to, uh, to 2018, where we are sonifying the entire span of time within two years. And so um, this uh, uh, next year, 2021 in November, uh, the sonification will synchronize to the building in real time. 
and then we'll sonify in real time from there. And also using um, uh, data being made available to the public. And just to, to, to be clear on how the sonification works, you got to hear a little bit of it. You got to hear these, these um, uh, ASMR sounds coming out of this, these, these owl rats. What's happening is that as the, as the building tilts and sinks more and more, um, the algorithm is taking those audio samples and it's um, playing them back um, with shorter durations between each sample, thus increasing a sense of density. And so as we hear it now, which is, you know, kind of slow and there's silence and, you know, these uh, sound elements are sort of appearing and disappearing, fading in, fading out. But as time co goes by, that building keeps falling and those samples are gonna to start to compress and overlap over each other and start to sound more and more noisy and cacophonous. Just so you get a better idea of what the long form composition is doing. It's an act of patience um, because we are dealing with real world data and it's not, uh, real impressive you know i mean it, it's one to think of like oh this is sinking uh an inch a year that that is impressive that is crazy to think about but when you're only dealing with like an inch a year as data for to differentiate tones you know you have to be really resourceful in how you present that data and i i think that's what we learned in this process is um you have to think outside of the literal one-to-one -one thinking and think about it more systematically and, and construct a system that can articulate that. Yeah, you have to you have to deal with it as a hyper object, you know, you can't perceive it. You can't yeah. perceive that movement of that building like like in in real time, like in compressed time, but in durational time, well you certainly can. And you can you can sonify that. But I don't know if I I don't know if I mentioned this when I was uh, presenting the piece, the the ASMR will be broadcasted until either the building falls, the building is um, demolitioned, or the problem of the sinking is solved. To date, it has not been solved. It is still sinking. And the opportunity, the the recommended pathway that they're pursuing will take anywhere between 15 years and 50 years. Um, there's a lot of unknowns uh, to this. Um, you know, it just points to a lot of the infrastructure that exists in the United States is developing for uh, a profit is one thing, developing for time is another, you know, uh, <laughs> those, are, those are two entirely different challenges. That's so interesting. I love this exploration of the different types of time. Uh, another question sort of related to sound, technical sound issues. Grace asks, how did you successfully record the sub bass reverberations? I think in the water piece, um, I find that so challenging. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh geez, I, I have to tell you all like we, um, I kind of had to laugh because you know, as Kate is uh, presenting the work and, you know, the work is, is grand. It's, you know, it's massive and it's in this very venerated space. And, and then you, and then I press the play button and I, I don't have my headphones on and it's coming out of the speakers <laughs> and it sounds like, you know, you're, you're using a, a, a rock hammer, you know, on a little Tupperware cup. Um, but um, it's, it is very difficult to, to, to make this kind of documentation and, and, but you put your headphones on, sure enough, that sub bass is there, you hear the reverberation, but you know, we asked the museum if they would professionally document, audio document the piece, they never got around to it. And then what ended up happening was, um, in order to get around that, I crowdsourced, uh, something like 60 recordings of the drum on social media that people made their own videos 
And I was able to extrapolate all of those sounds and create a massive multi-track scenario. And I was able to mix like 30 crowdsourced uh, social media recordings into a singular representation of the drum. And then I mastered it. And through that process was able to roughly approximate kind of like what it felt like being there. Fortunately, we're gonna be showing this piece again in uh, Canada in an exhibition that opens uh, in September and at the uh, Ramey uh, Modern uh, uh, in Saskatoon. And uh, it's a single, it's a solo show for the entire, for the whole museum uh, of all, all new work. And this is the one work that, I mean, it's new to us, but it's still, uh, it, it's the only work that's not made just for uh, that show. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we'll be able to document it and get some good sound, probably put the accelerometer on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly. Just to, to answer your question directly, um, if I had to record it, um, I would use a drum bass mic and I would put it at the porthole at the top of the tank. Um, and then I would, we would also use some uh, condenser microphones to uh, microphone the room. They put in the, you know, four corners, you know, four uh, sort of quadraphonic setup, the drum mic in the actual um, uh, porthole. And then I would put a mic on the undercarriage of the drum where the mallet is striking the drum from within. And then I would also hang a mic into the drum itself. And then I would take a recording of all of those elements and then I would put it together in a multi-track and then I would mix and master. So it, you know, it's, it's very involved, you know, requ would require at least, at least six mics, microphones and specialized microphones. That's crazy. That sounds great though. Um, I'm really looking forward to your show in Canada. I'll have to keep an eye oh, out. Right on. Yeah, we're really excited about it. Sounds great. Um, let's see, changing gears a little bit, Beck asks, did you always feel able to push institutions to have skin in the game? Or did that not become possible until you reached a certain level in your career? How do you approach that conversation? Well, I just, I just want to prime the pump because I know that Kate was, is going to be able to answer this question in a very profound way. Um, I, I joined Post Commodity and uh, I did my first work with Post Commodity in 2009. And uh, Cade and uh, Steven Yazi founded the collective in 2007. And I was really an official full time member of the collective in 2010. I, I wanted to be part of Post Commodity since, you know, 2009. Post Commodity um, had cut a, a hole in the museum uh, floor of the, uh, of the gallery space at the Arizona State University Art Museum. And um, uh, I went and I visited that work and I said to myself, damn, I gotta be part of this group. And um, serendipity would have it that that would come true. I got really lucky, I think, and very grateful for that. But, but, the, but the, the thing is that post-commodity started pushing at institutions almost since day one. I, I would just say since day one, that's always been integrated into the structural DNA of the collective because we understand building as theory metaphor. We understand that these buildings represent the very DNA of uh, you know, Western thinking. And if we're gonna be able to engage Western thinking in a really, in an intellectual, philosophical and metaphorical way, we gotta be able to hack these systems. We gotta hack this infrastructure. We gotta interact with this, with this, uh, with this in infrastructure because the very act of hacking it is the very act of, um, of um, in, in many ways, bringing it to life in, and complicating it in ways that we, I think, have always known lead to great, great dialogue and great, 
great experiences. And so turn it over to Cade because, you know, a lot of this, uh, this DNA of engaging institutions in this way, he comes, he, he's got like, you know, tw over 20 years of public policy, professional public policy work, you know, on, in Capitol Hill. So he comes from a policy, uh, has a lot of policy uh, knowledge of public affairs. And so understands how to get into these dialogues with institution, how to, how to politically engage in governance and how to you know, facilitate and help to facilitate these conversations. Sorry, Kate, I hope I am still too much thunder there, man, but just started rolling off the tongue. It, you know, it's, it, it's true. It started from the very beginning. And, you know, we all had individual art practices and, um, uh, and we had a, a thing. And another person to, to call out too is, is Nathan Young. Um, he was one of the co-founders um, as well. Uh, he's a Delaware Pawnee uh, and Kiowa dude uh, from uh, Oklahoma, uh, from Tahlequah, Oklahoma, living in Tulsa. And uh, yeah, Yazi's Navajo. And, and uh, you know, he was one of the, a, a pretty big figure in, in the Phoenix art scene. And, you know, and um, he, uh, the three of us together, uh, you know, we made an agreement. We weren't gonna pay for this stuff. We were gonna make other people pay for it. And we were only gonna take projects that had um, a, a complexity and scale that we wouldn't do individually. You know, so th the whole purpose was to do what we couldn't do as independent artists. And um, it's so much, when you have that kind of attitude, like I've got my individual art practice and I'm able to do something proficiently and I'm gonna do something here with this group of people that I can't do individually. That brings a totally different context to the to the table and you know it requires negotiation um because if you don't want to pay for something yourself you're gonna have to negotiate access to resources um and so from a very simple pragmatic uh standpoint i think that's always been it is just let's engage in a conversation and see what's possible. And, and a lot of that's informed from policy. Um, you know, let's engage in a conversation, see what's possible. Uh, governance is not about revolution. Governance is about refinement over time. And that idea that, you know, an art practice is something that evolves over time. You can't achieve everything you want to achieve in one work. You have to think about 20 works, 30 works, and achieving what you want to achieve over that. And that's just been how we've knocked it off is, you know, one strategy uh, to negotiate resources for a particular reimagined ceremonial cause, you know, uh, and, and purpose. But, you know, the challenge is, it's not like, okay, you have to negotiate um, and, and work with an institution in a way to where you can wield power. Um, it's really about um, how can I work in a way that enables the ideas that are on the table to be um, legible within the walls or within the exterior boundaries of the institution. And what we have found is indigenous people that the institution is, is typically not um, uh, situated in terms of uh, administrative capacity or, or um, knowledge of, of uh, Indian people, we often get racialized. And, um, you know, we're here on our lands. We've been here before the term race was invented. It was invented by people from Europe, the idea of race. We didn't know about that. 
And so these institutions try to engage in us, engage with us in a way that placates their existing, you know, power structures and dynamics that they've funded and they're in the process of administering, but they're not just administering, you know, a project or a program or a department. Um, they're administering a worldview. And when you think about how a worldview is administered and you disassociate it from individuals and think about it as a spirit, as a thing, it makes the process of engagement much easier because there's no beginning or end to it. It's not specific to an institution. It's part of a much larger you know, process, a much larger project. And when you think that way, you don't think of the consequence of no, because it alleviates that, um, that end point. There is no no if you see it as part of a larger arc, if you see this as part of a, a spiritual encounter. Um, and I think that not to dehumanize it in a way, not to dehumanize the negotiation process, but to take it and put it in its context that it's bigger than us. When things are bigger than us, we rise to the occasion, we do what's right, and we can get those communications nailed down so that everyone benefits from it. And I don't know if you've hung out with policy people, um, but one of the greatest experiences that you can have is to sit at the table with people who are on the opposite side of the fence as you when you're beginning your negotiation and you build a place where everybody's happy. That is, yeah. like, that is like a spiritual human thing that will reaffirm any belief or aspiration you have in what we're capable of doing as human beings. And that's all we're trying to do within the art world is to achieve that, you know? Um, and maybe we don't know how else to work because, you know, Cristobal is this, um, you know, diplomat. He's a linguist who studied, you know, rhetoric and he can deconstruct a scenario and reconstruct it in seconds and realign the tensions, you know, linguistically, logically, structurally um, over time. And you have to see it to believe it. But I think if you get the two of us together, we, we can have that ability to, to do it. I know by myself, I, I'm not able to do that, you know, but with people, with these kinds of skill sets that we have that are complementary, it's like, so far, so good, you know? Yeah, you know, and that's what I want is, I just want to highlight what Kay just said to all the students out there. It, you know, if a kind of art like post commodity is really structured around aspirations of thought leadership. It's about trying to flip the script, for example, on trauma narratives and trying to demonstrate an ability to be able to go in and to operate on the world in, in, in to, to, to reconfigure reality, but, but within political scenarios where all the players are amenable to transformation of the self. And everybody is jointly interested in transformation of the institution and redistribution of resources. And in order to do work like this, I think I would argue in order to make contemporary art and you know, art, I sound like a broken record because I say this all the time. Art has to be many things in many different places at many different times. But one thing that it could be, especially now during the time of climate change, during the time of high speed you know, communication systems, during the time of, 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 um, of tactical, you know, cybernetic warfare, physical warfare, um, uh, extremely fast market systems and a pandemic, it's like we have to, as artists, be ready for that world and be ready to engage that world. And the only way we're gonna do that is we have to think of ourselves as more than just artists. We have to be artist philosophers. We have to be artist engineers. 
We have to be artist scholars, artist linguists, with the artist, artist, anything you can imagine. Artist chefs, <laughs> artist poets. We gotta really extend ourselves. And we gotta bring ourselves into, into an interdisciplinary way of being so that we can uh, be versatile at both in expressions of interiority, but through public facing ex exteriority. And I think that's something we've always been really committed to. And we've always been um, critical of indigenous tropes in art, which are a lot about dramatizing identity and a lot about dramatizing trauma. And you know, the art, look at this building behind me. This is the hall of sculpture. This thing was created by Andrew Carnegie, the late Andrew Carnegie, the steel baron in Pittsburgh. It made billions of dollars and he created this hall of sculpture. This, um, this, um, these are your patrons. These are the folks that are on the boards of institutions. And these are the patrons of art. Why are we making artworks where, 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 where we're dramatizing, you know, very, very deep personal uh, and private quote unquote traumas for the gaze of folks who construct buildings like this. We actually have to write, I believe we really have to get in to these places as context, and we need to engage with them, you know, in 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 complex, in complex and nuanced ways that go way, way, way beyond our identities. You know, I know who I am. My community knows who I am. My community named who I am. Now that's the context. Now, I want to deal with the land. We want to deal with the land. We want to deal with the violence. We want to deal with, we want to deal with the issues and we want to do it in a way that's uh, both uh, can be very brutal, can be very cutting, can be very cynical, but yet can be very aspirational. We want to do it in a way that is generative, that is going to move the conversation and that is going to create a conversation where you know people learn to be more civil, and you know more more um, uh, courageous than some of what we're currently seeing. Sorry, man, manifesto or something. Out uh, loud manifestos. <laughs> well, thank you for that generous response. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a, a related question. I think you guys kind of touched on it a little bit already, but I'll ask anyway. Um, Danielle asks, do you have examples that your collaborations or works with institutions did not work? They restrict your ideas. I guess the institutions restrict your ideas. How do you deal with this? Well, um, you know, every institution does that. Every, so every work is an example of that. Every single work is a process of overcoming limitations and restrictions and knows. No one comes out and says, we're going to let you stress the, you know, uh, engineering integrity of our, you know, cash cow, uh, wedding cash cow and, and, you know, convening cash cow uh, for our institution. You know, no one's going to say, here's the keys do it that sounds great you know you you really have to um you have to want to do that and you have to have a game plan for doing that we, we you know the thing about the art world that is is really in in neat right now is uh are useful for us is regardless of the neoliberal crap that's reverberating through the walls uh, and of these institutions and, you know, the, the progressive white nationalism of, of um, you know, the progressive movement. And I say white nationalism because, uh, you know, it's, they're still advancing a Judeo-Christian Western scientific worldview. It's just a horizontal shift of ethics and morals. 
uh, and objectives, but from an indigenous perspective, they still have the same relationship to land and consumption as um, the other white nationalists, say the white nationalists that stormed the, you know, um, the capital. Um, but, you know, the thing is, you can enter into a conversation from a place of power. And Cristobal talked a lot about that in the previous answer, but you can have your hat in your hand or you can speak from power. And when, when you are able to feel comfortable with who you are and work from a place of power and be willing to walk away in every one of the works that we've done, we've been willing to walk away. We were willing to walk away from Documenta. We were willing to walk away from anything. Um, uh, you, and that's, that's what you have to do. You have to be able to say no um, and protect yourselves. But what's neat about the art world, regardless of the baggage, what I was getting to is there's this desire for freedom, for creative freedom. It's still a value that's out there and it may be more alive today than ever before. It comes with more baggage today than ever before, that's for sure. But the commitment to freedom of expression and radical expression is unparalleled in any other art form. You know, literature, uh, dance, uh, theater, film. You can't go to the places we can go to in the visual art world. And that is the thing that we have going for us in all of these places. So regardless of the negative um, or the challenging or um, the consequence of having to compromise or build consensus, all of that is being built upon this belief in creative freedom and expression and the idea that the stories we share demonstrate our collective humanity and that we are not alone in this experience of being human, that it is a shared experience. See that, it, all these things are built upon that. So we can critique the art world and critique the institution all we want, but at the end of the day, there's still something really beautiful that that institution is trying to accomplish. And that's what we just, we tried to focus on that aspect. And um, so when we get there and we get there together with the curator, with the preparators, with the exhibition designers, we get there with all of that, um, it's usually a good space. It's usually workable. It's usually worth, you know, it's worth the risk, worth the effort, worth the blood, sweat, tears, whatever cliche you want to throw at it, because there's that creative thing. There's that institutional stewardship. And you have this opportunity to take a gut punch, but also to possibly harmonize, you know, the administration of power um, with the creative spirit and the desire for creative freedom. You know, and that is like, that's what we're all here for. You know, the art is just a container of the ideas. You know, we, it's easy to get lost in containers. People buy, spend lots of money on containers, but it's really just the ideas, you know. The, um, it's a terrible quote, <laughs> probably kill me, Kate. I just think of the Rolling Stones, you, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, yeah. you get what you need. <laughs> and you gotta be open like that. <laughs> you got you come to the table with some aspirations, but you're gonna negotiate. And sometimes, sometimes the negotiations aren't gonna go in your favor, and you're not gonna get that one thing you want to have for this work of art. And sometimes it has. Uh, sometimes it has symbolic value, it has cultural value, it has political value, and it can hurt. It can feel like a gut punch. But you, you have to, you have to be, be able to hold, you have to have grit. You have to be able to hold space and have grit. And you get back on the horse and you gotta, you gotta keep 
move in the negotiation. You got, that's why these things take years. You know, everything we showed you took at least two years, three years just to negotiate. And so you always have to be open. You have to be open. Not only uh, you never come to the table with a, with concrete, you come to the table with, we're not dry concrete. You come to the table wet concrete because that thing's got to be formed in some way. And you might have an idea of how it gets formed, but you got to let the institution speak because the institutions, when they speak and they create certain constraints, certain challenges, that's always an opportunity to make a better work of art. And hands down, every single time Kate and I are prevented from going the full distance, if the institution puts, puts in place a barrier or a hard stop, we always leverage that to create an even more succinct, more legible, more potent gesture. So you just got to always learn to adapt and be open, always open to adapting and never, never come to the table with this is the way this thing is going to be. I always just come to the table with ideas that are ripe for development. Luck has a lot to do too, as it turns out. Uh, Serendipity. Yeah, the harder you work, the more luck you get in some ways. But um, I was just thinking about the piece that is behind Chris Sowal, just, um, we were able to get that hall for that exhibition. And that's such a hard space to get. It's 3000 square feet of floor space for a international biennial. And we don't even have a serious gallery representation. You know, we, we're out there on our own for the most part. So um, it's, you know, it takes time. And it takes being there and being present and it, perseverance and a collectives have an advantage. We can play good cop, bad cop. <laughs> well, thanks for that inspiring words about how to deal with institutions. Um, it's great to hear. Let's see, Sheila has a question about kind of the way your collective is structured how many artists are in the collective? Right now, there's just Kate and me and Kate, Kate and me. Uh, the collective has um, uh, expanded and contracted over time. Uh, it's had a total of, um, let's see, uh, five members since its inception. And our collective is, um, and the collective is, you know, well over a decade old now, this is 2007, so do the math. Um, the years are, are really going by. And, um, and the, the, the collective is really is a vocational, you know, it's like a vocation. It like, it really consumes your risk. It's like a plant that needs a lot of attention a lot of watering, a lot of tilling, <laughs> like you got to talk to it, you got to sing to it, you got to water it, you got to feed it, you know, make sure you put it in the sun. And, um, you know, that has, that, that, that's a significant commitment. And so, you know, it, it requires kind of shifts in, um, in, in artists involved. Kate and I are the most, we were the most masochistic masochistic of all of them we 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 could take a we could take it man <laughs> it's 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 hard work it's really hard work but we're structured as a um as a as a learning community as i said earlier like for example um uh, in the collective we have uh, very strong engineering skills uh, we have computer science skills we have skills in public policy we're poets music composers and musicians and we're visual artists we just bring it all together and so like um one thing we talked about like kate kate uh, uh shared that you know i have a doctorate in linguistics and rhetoric and kate has and i just shared that kate has you know 
over two decades of public affairs experience working in Indi Indian country on behalf of uh, tribes, lobbying on behalf of tribes. Um, so uh, he's got knowledge and I've got knowledge. And so whenever we work on a project, we use the project as an opportunity to share that knowledge with each other so that I can become skilled at public affairs and Cade becomes skilled at linguistics. And so that's what we mean by moving toward interdisciplinary versus transdisciplinary. I don't know if that's right, you know, in alignment with a dictionary or some, you know, scholarly definition. It's our definition. Our definition is interdisciplinary is like when a collective embodies a set of, of, of knowledge. But a transdisciplinary is when everybody in the collective has embodies that shared knowledge together. And that for us is aspirational. And so we structure our collective around that aspiration. And so because learning and you know, a belief in sharing knowledge is such a, um, such a foundational uh, idea within uh, post-commodity, the consequence is that all the art we make, when we talk about like a grounds for reimagined ceremony or ceremonial complex, we're really talking about a pedagogical space the space where people can learn and people, you know, because there's history embedded, there's ideas embedded, there's, there's culture, there's art, but there's also an opportunity for joint meaning making and, you know, co-determined and consensual meaning making is how knowledge is created in the world. So, you know, pedagogy is, I have to say, we're structured around pedagogy in many ways. And we have protocols for how to for how to um, for how to be the best we can be with each other. It's just the two of us now, right now, and so we have to take care of each other. That's hard work, and we don't always get it right. But we try to use apply a critical indigenous research methodologies framework. We take inspiration from uh, uh, Professor Brian Braveboy at Arizona State University and, and Native American uh, um, uh, policy um, um, person, a very, very um, uh, important uh, woman in Indian country, LaDonna Harris, who uh, speak about um, uh, these R's, these, these four R's which is, uh, there's actually five of them if you put, combine Brian Brayboy and LaDonna Harris's discourse together, but it's respect, reciprocity, relationships, responsibility, and redistribution. And that's what we try to do. We structure, we try to structure our collective so that it's honoring every one of those registers. And we found that if we can center it on those registers, that we're, we're okay, that we have balance that we're doing okay, that we're happy, that we're, that we're um, uh, thinking, you know, at, at the top of our game. And we bring that ethos and that framework, not only to how we structure our collective, but how we structure all our relationships with, for example, the institutions that we partner with along the way and our audiences. And this is super aspirational. We're humans. <laughs> Always bear in mind we're humans. We make a lot of mistakes. It's not easy. I think that's really important to recognize. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that generous response. Um, we're kind of running out of time, but there's just a couple more questions that people had in the chat. Sort of related to the last question, Providence asks, so in your projects, do you hire artists outside of your collective? For instance, did you hire artists to paint the lowriders? Oh, oh yeah, that's a, such a killer question. I'm sorry, Kate, go for it. Yeah, we, we with, with that um, piece in particular, um, we definitely did. We worked with, um, you know, in, in, in work that, is I, you know, I teach social practice, so I'm getting so cynical about it, but so please forgive it because I have a 
this working relationship with it uh, that is good and bad. But, um, you know, when you're doing a work like this, you, you, you really want to build, you, you want to utilize, you know, existing infrastructures. You don't want to go into a project and like try to invent your own infrastructure and um, uh, force your agenda. You work on a, you know, a, w within the framework of existing social policy goals and, and, you know, existing organize, organized movements and, and, you know, so part of that is looking at these hot rod and custom shops, you know, a, like we, we worked with uh, Starlight, you know, hot rod and custom. And that was, uh, it's, you know, Chicano owned business. Um, it's a family business. Um, and, you know, it's home to a network of, of uh, like a storehouse of, of lowrider builders and, and painters and creators. And um, we worked within the framework of uh, the, the shop and um, the people whose careers revolved around that shop and worked within those intersections and um, uh, commissioned um, them, redistributed our commission and, uh, you know, to uh, the artists working through that shop and their uh, uh, affiliate members and friends, you know, so um, that's very much um, you know, taken through the, you know, Edgar Hernandez, who is uh, a, a huge figure in, in that world and has accomplished so much. Um, it's following his lead, you know, and working within ways that he's comfortable working and his friends are comfortable working and, and finding ways to if you can talk a lowrider painter into like painting a an I beam, you know you have a pretty good relationship. Uh, so it, it's really about the relationship. And um, but yeah, we we do that. We've um, when there is a structural issue that we can't resolve, we'll hire an architect. You know, uh, just like anyone else. You, you know, there's some things that you just cannot do and you need to, you know, expand the collaboration or establish a, a contract fee for service type of relationship. And, and we're, we'll do either one, you know, we definitely don't want to extrapolate free labor from people. So um, we always try to, you know, support whoever it is that we're collaborating with. And, you know, sometimes the collaboration is out of, you know, pragmatic need, but sometimes the, coll the collaboration itself is part of the conceptual framework, framing of the work. And so it's important to recognize that there is a distinction there. And so there's various combinations of that, those distinctions happening in some of our works. But, you know, one thing that's really important too, like we hired a contractor to build the, um, the columns, you know, at the Art Insti Museum of the Art Institute of Chicago. And so, you know, we're, we're not used to um, a lot of times valorizing the work of the construction workers are up, the labor of construction work workers, you know, so it contextualizes that labor as art. And it is, if you look at those columns, look at how beautiful, look at how beautifully made they are, how precise how carefully crafted they are. And so, you know, we, you, you, you can almost always think of no matter, no matter who you bring on board on, a, on an art project, uh, whatever services or expertise are rendered, and whether that's part of the conceptual framing of the piece or not, you're, you're always working with artists. You know, I think we always try to honor everybody we work with as artists, regardless of, you know, what the craft is or the skill set is, or the services that people are providing. And we, we've hired mathematicians as well and other computer scientists and things of that nature. Um, yeah, it, it, and we've, we, there, 
like one uh, mathematician we worked with twice. And we actually put his name on our website as a post commodity collaborator. You know, we want to honor the contributions of Andrew McCord, you know. Yeah. So, you know, those things are very important. Very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for that response. Um, I'm just going to ask one more question uh, to end on. Container Terminal asks, the concept of collapse and experience of sonic space seems to be the running theme of your practice. Is an arc slash coherent slash inner logic important to the diverse practice of the collective? Can you read those last slash points again? Sure. Is an arc slash coherence slash inner logic important to the diverse practice of the collective? I, for sure. Um, you know, we're building a discourse and the discourse has already been, it already exists. We're, we're building a shift in it, uh, a tributary. And, um, y you know, when you're working from a, a from a position of discourse um, or from a proposition, you know, you could think of it as going back to the article that uh, Joseph Kasuth wrote to uh, Art uh, After Philosophy. You know, if you're working from a proposition to where your work is, um, the purpose of your work is to create, to generate meaning, to substantiate, you know, what value that you're trying to bring into the world through your work. Um, hell yeah, that, that, that drives um, your voice that gives you a voice across disciplines and across material, you know, it gives you purpose across material and disciplines. And um, hopefully it, it, it substantiates coherency over time. You know, if, if you're just, and here's a, a, a thing to think about is if you're not working from a position of discourse or a place of power, um, where your research is, is, is driving the work and your research is, is driving discourse, um, driving the recovery of knowledge and the organization of knowledge in a way that creates relevancy, um, it's gonna work together it, regardless of what material you use. Um, after 20 years, those works will be part of a singular ecology, you know? And for us, that's easy to do because we don't have the pressures of a gallery. You know, we don't make work at all for a gallery. We don't have people really collecting our work. I wish we did. I'd love to sell work. I'd love to not be, you know, live in a van, but uh, down by the river. Um, with the <laughs> ice chest, uh, but it would be um, it would be nice. But the thing is, that's a freedom equation. You know, if we're not making for a market-driven demand, you know, to fulfill an expectation, then we have freedom to make from a place of self-determination. You know, a play because if if you're not working from your discourse and your research, then you're going to be working um, according to the resources that are made available to you otherwise. In other words, you'll be working to advance someone else's discourse, someone else's mission, someone else's goals and objectives. So I think that's been a really important you know, aspect to our work is to be working in service of post-commodity and the families that we you know, represent and the communities we represent and the nations and you know we represent tribal nations we represent so um if we left it up to just chasing resources per project it, we would be an incoherent probably a um uh driven by uh the losses of our history you know driven by um trauma and uh 
uh, we would be leaving behind an aesthetics of trauma. And whereas I think what we're doing is leaving behind an aesthetics that are generative and they're an aesthetics of self-determination. Um, and those are two very different things, you know? And, um, but I think Joseph Kasuth really provided us with, you know, early in the expanded field, you know, endeavor. Um, he laid out a very powerful roadmap that I think can serve a, a, a broad number of cultures and, and makers and, and working in a variety of disciplines because it, it is an algorithm that is based on building truth and power around your work and around your art practice and, and around the ideas that, that you care about and engage in the role, you know? And I don't have anything more to add. That was, that was really awesome. And this, I wanna just thank everybody, uh, everyone who is still online with us, cause this has been a marathon run and thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. It's a real honor and privilege for us. Thanks a bunch. And yeah. thank you Bailey for facilitating this Q and A. It's really killer. It is nice sharing with what is possibly the best art school in, in the in the US, you know, UCSD is, in my mind, one of the most important places of contemporary arts pedagogy. And um, it's it is an honor to contribute and to be a part of that. Well, thank you both so much for coming and joining us today. There's just like an outpouring of gratitude in the chat. Everybody's so thankful and amazed by your lecture. Thank it was you. great. Um, thanks so much for joining us and being so generous with your responses and your time. We really appreciate it. Oh, that's, yeah. that's excellent. Is this, real quick, is this uh, going to be posted on the online or? Yeah, it'll be on the YouTube link. Uh -huh. Or is it just live? It's live and then usually we post it on the YouTube afterwards. All right, that's great. That's yeah. great. Glad to hear it. Awesome. All right, well, that's thank awesome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Paolo for helping us with the technical side of things. Thanks yeah. for doing the introduction. Thank you, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you guys again. Thank you. Great talk. Take right Be on. Good care. Be safe out there. Bye. Bye-bye.